Hey, what up? This your boy David Lucas, fishing with David Lucas. And today I have the legendary Mr. Ron White. <laughs> right here, fishing David Lucas. Telling me everything he knows about it. <laughs> so far, he's the most uh, knowledgeable fisherman we've had on the show. I didn't have to bait his hook. I didn't have to uh, <laughs> throw it out there. It's, I, I made it as easy as possible for my podcast to get these little push button zip codes, and people still have a. These UFC yeah. fighters who can kill a human. Right, they can't, can't they, 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 they can't master this little piece of equipment. <laughs> and I'm a horrible teacher. I'm a horrible teacher, man. Finally got Mr. Ron White on the podcast. He is a legendary stand-up comedian. I mean, I, I grew up watching you. Uh, Larry the Cable Guy. Uh, Jeff Foxworthy. Man, those were... God, poor Bill Ingvall. He never gets mentioned, you know. That. Oh, Bill, Bill. Also, <laughs> how did I forget about Bill? Very true. He never, no, you're right. <laughs> but I'm sure he made a ton of money, right? Oh, yeah. You know, Bill's got a a ranch in Colorado and a ranch in Texas and oh, lives in Park Cities and Tempe. Oh, yeah, he's yeah he's good. He's more than good. He's only had one wife. That's a bargain. Did he get hooked? <laughs> What? <laughs> so he ain't paid too much money in divorces. Yeah. That's why they show my net worth on. I'm like, oh, they missed a couple divorces in there. <laughs> <laughs> and you a Texas boy, right? Born and raised. I was born in a little town called Fritch, Texas, which is kind of about 60 miles north, uh, northeast of Amarillo. Oh, okay. But I grew up, and that was a little bitty dirt town. And I, but I grew up in the Houston area. Nice. Deer I Park. I like Houston. I like Houston a lot. You wouldn't have liked the part of it I lived in. It was right in the middle of the refineries and oh. across, the, across the way from a paper plant that turned out a funk yeah. so yeah. deep that you couldn't stand it would the, the only thing good about it if you were driving drunk which we used to do back in the day <laughs> it smelled so bad it would wake you up a little bit <laughs> like, oh i'm getting right, close right I'm, I'm getting close yeah. yeah i grew up by a paper mill man i'm thinking stink oh, uh, what, i don't know what it is they use the sulfur or whatever but yeah it stinks yeah, that's crazy when did you, did you so you started comedy in the houston area no i i you know i didn't start stand up till i was 28 and uh i had uh, moved to Midland, Texas, and married a girl, and uh, and then uh, went to work for a company called Barter Systems, which trades goods and services between companies, which sounds okay. Mm -hmm. And I got it, and I could sell it. Right. And uh, but the bottom, the problem is, if you got one service that's putting in diamonds, the other was putting in popcorn, you end up with a lot of popcorn. Right. Right. So. Uh, uh, they, they talked me into going as the office manager and sales manager to Abilene for this guy's brother's version of that company or his uh, franchise of it. So I got out there and, and it was just horrible. The guy didn't have any money and uh, you, could, uh, you, could, you, you could spend trade units on some restaurants and right. stuff and we found a little apartment. And uh, eventually, when he finally did write me a check, I, I owed everybody money, and I bounced checks all over town, and I left town. And uh, we lived in this little apartment, and we had a, a couch, a bit, kind of a big couch for the apartment. And we got it in there, but we couldn't get it out. And we left it hanging in the door, like 3 o'clock in the morning. We'd been moving out. We just left right. it. was stuck there. We, just, <laughs> ah, we lost the couch, you know. Right. So we drive all night to Dallas, and my wife had a friend that, that lived there. I thought I'd And she, uh, I got it, I got it, I got it. Uh, and she was at work, so uh, we went, went in her backyard, and she had a, I was filthy from moving all night, you know. And she had a big red Doberman that walked over to me and pissed on my leg. I'm like, this day, this day sucks. <laughs> and it keeps on sucking. And I started selling windows and doors. Okay. Somebody opened a comedy club between where I lived and where I worked uh -huh. called The Funny Bone. And uh, a guy I worked with named Sam Bartholomew went to the first open mic night and came back to the office the next day and said, Ron, you're funnier than these guys. <laughs> and uh, you should go do this. Right. So I went down there the next open mic night and auditioned with my four minutes and got a spot. And they'd put me on every other week. And Nice. 
and uh, and that was 30, uh, 37 and a half years ago. Oh, wow. Ron White been doing comedy longer than I've been alive. That's good. Yeah. That, that's why you're so good. The, uh, well, you know, it, it, it it's not how long you've been doing it. It's how much of it do you do. Right. So I've been doing it a long time, but I've also been doing a lot of it for a long time. Right. You know, when I was a feature act, uh, I was actually, uh, I, I got, Sam Kennison had come to Dallas and canceled the show when he was coming back. And Carl LeBeau, who was his regular opening act, uh, was Carl in LeBeau, rehab. The, the guy for, in, that was in L.A.? Yeah, LeBeau. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Funny guy. He was Kennison's guy. Okay. He opened all his shows, right. and uh, but they, you know they always had trouble in those camps, and and uh, so I got a call day of show because they needed somebody, and they said, "Hey, Ron White's pretty good," and and uh, they called me. Said you want to open for Kennison at the Dallas County Convention Theater, two thousand people. I've never been in for more than three hundred, and it went great. I mean, I just killed it. Sam wasn't there. Uh, he hadn't showed up yet. And, so uh, his you. brother was there, Bill, and um, he said, uh, just go out there. He said, a lot of times the opening act is a sacrificial lamb because they just want <laughs> Sam, you know. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, well, I'll try. <laughs> so I went out there and murdered. Best set I'd ever had, 2,000 people. And and then Sam gets there after I'm already off stage, and uh, he's not worried about anything. And he, he, uh, <laughs> he takes me back to this. He's got like a little dressing suite with some lobster and shit, and I got a six pack of beer. And Alex Ramundo, who was he was at yeah, this show. I know Alex Ramundo. He was at this show, yeah. and um, so uh, as soon as he gets there, he sends his bodyguard to get me, so he wants to meet the other act and he's respectful that way, you know. And uh, and he had a little two room. He was in a back room, and he had a, a hooker. I can only guess was a hooker and uh, and a big vial of cocaine that was something was stuck in the top of it and he was banging it on the table trying to get a rock out of it and and uh, he goes uh, heard you killed him cowboy and I'm like yeah Sam it's a nice uh, nice crowd you're gonna have fun with these guys he goes how about a cup of coffee and I'm like you know, I got to do a bump of Sam you know I, and uh, so I did it and he did a big old huge rail and he faked a heart attack. And nobody believed it but me because they had all seen the show before. You know, the, this is backstage. And so he's on the ground faking a heart attack, looks real as shit. I'm about to fucking go mouth to mouth on the guy <laughs> to get him out of it, Sam Kennison. And, uh, and he jumps off the floor. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, all right. And, uh, and he goes out there and he just slaughters the, the place. And uh, afterwards, I was gonna, there were people there from the Punchline and the Funny Bones, some comedy club chains, and they said, hey, we want to go out to dinner with you and talk to you about your career, nice. what we can do for you. That was on one shoulder. On the older, other shoulder was Sam Kennison going, hey, I got a limousine and some strippers. And, so, <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I'm going to see you all later. Right. Sam and I got a, a night I, planned, and I uh, been the same we, way. we'll catch up with you on all this stuff tomorrow. So. Uh, I went out with Sam that night and had a, an awfully good time. Alex was doing stand-up by that time, and he and I would either get in my Toyota truck or his. No, I had a Nissan truck, base Nissan truck, bench vinyl seat that would bend you over the steering wheel after 50 miles, and, uh, and or his Toyota that had big tires and stuff on it. It wasn't a great ride either. And uh, we'd drive it. 800 miles, do one nighters wow. for Comedy Zone, wow. you know, and just and just having fun and yes, and and partying hard, 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 and and uh, and, and just both of us in total disbelief that, is that we were yeah. able to make a living doing it. And, and I was making like, you know, I was making maybe maybe 175 a night maybe on the road and he was making like 75 mm. and uh <laughs> but we we still thought we were ruling the world right. and uh, there was some other guy who was the poor headliner right. and he wasn't a great headliner and, and uh and i was a really powerful middle act even then and uh so the headliners because they you know the c room headliners right. they couldn't right. follow me right 
And uh, so we did that for a little while till I started getting the bigger jobs. They moved him up to the next spot. So nice. then we felt, we felt like we were rich, you know, on, on the road. Now I'm making a, a you know, a grand at 1200 a week. Wow. For none real. of my friends made that much money. Back <laughs> for real. And I wasn't paying my taxes. So, you know, it seemed like uh, I was making even more money. <laughs> paying those taxes is very important. It's very important. But if you don't pay your taxes, for like years, and then you end up making a whole bunch of money, you can pay those back taxes in one night. And they go, okay, here's that money. We're square, yeah, we're good, all right. Thanks right. for the loan. All right. I needed the money then, and uh, you know. Right, they don't care until you get a chunk of change. Yeah, and then they'll come get it, but that's okay with me. So you started headlining pretty early on in your career, huh? I did, uh, and I, uh, Part of the reason why is I played pretty bad rooms, and the guys that they had just weren't that good. Right, right. and uh, and you know they considered me up up and coming, and I would do it cheaper. You know, so I would take the work from those guys. I didn't care. My goal was to bury everybody that went on behind me, right, and get their job next time through. That was my whole plan. That's and uh, <laughs> and and nobody blamed me for it. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. Show what the pecking order is always changing. And uh, so, uh, you know, I went out. I know I told you all the story about getting the horrible review <coughs> out in California. Oh, when you, uh, the, was it in San Diego? It was in uh, Newport. Where the guy uh, wrote the article about you? Yeah, the yeah. horrible article. Yeah. And, uh, and it was, it, but the, then the thing was, it was just the truth. It was just a bad, bad, bad review that made me, I, I can still quote it to this day. I read it so many times and agreed with it 100%. Mm. And uh, so th that kind of caused me to go to just come up with a different plan, which is just stay in the Midwest where the work is and sharpen the blade. Keep right. doing those long sets every night and, so, yeah. uh, and, and see, how good, see how good you can get. Right. And, uh, and, and, and actually what that guy said was dead on perfectly correct and uh i have no problem with it at all it's uh, that's what i should have heard at that time of yes. my career sometimes we need that and uh, <laughs> yeah yeah the truth yes. every once yeah. in a while somebody's yeah. gonna come tell the truth and uh and 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 that's exactly what i did i just went out and worked my face off and just got the only thing that makes you better at this is you know stage time yeah that's how how much are you on stage uh, are you on stage every single day because that's what you should do and, uh, you know, so that's, I just made sure I always had tons and tons of work. That's what I love about Rogan's Club, man. Like, I didn't realize it was going to be like this. Like, he said it, you know, like yeah. somebody can say something. <laughs> right. But saying it and then actually yeah. seeing it, like, in the last week, like, it, it's the per like, it's perfect to live in Austin because when I'm not on the road, I can still do headliner time. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, uh, during my David Lucas and Friends show, I could do an hour at the end if I want to. 45 minutes, work out new material. And in between, since the club has opened, I've did like 18 spots. It is the best situation for a comic to be in is to have access to Austin, Texas right now. Yes. Because, the you know, there's, there's not that much stage time for people that aren't famous in L.A., you know, the, the big guys can go in and get their spots every week, but everybody else is fighting over a pretty small bone. And, exactly. Uh, but out here, you know, with, uh, with the other things that are coming to town with comedy, that right. Joe just embraces all of it. Come yeah. on, bring clubs. We'll make this the comedy destination. Exactly. Like, yeah, like, but I, I'll have the opportunity, and so will you, right, to do four sets tonight. Yes. Uh, and uh, there's no, you know, I really felt like when I, I, well, I didn't do stand-up for 15 months, and I was really thinking about quitting. And uh, Oh, that, and, was, that was that show in Austin when you first came back on stage after... Chappelle and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, those I was, shows. I was there. And I was, you know, I was pretty dried up. And if it would have gone on much longer, I would have been completely dried up. And uh, so it was really Joe and... And uh, and Chappelle and getting back in with the tribe that I'd been separated from, you know, the guys that love what I love and, right. and, and the guys 
and women that that have chosen to do with their life exactly what I chose to do with my life, which was to go around and make people laugh and see how that works out. And uh, so, and Joe just would never hear about me retiring. And, and, and so then I went around and finished all the dates that I had on the books. I got my chops back, and uh, but I made a decision to retire, and, and that's what I did at the end of the year. But this club is too hard to resist. It's like a warm bath, man. The best sound I've ever heard. The most beautiful club that's ever been imagined. And, uh, you know, it was like Rogan's gift to the comedy community and to Austin. You know, he didn't need that. And uh, he did it so we'd all have this great place to grow. And he's such a, you know, a, a cool part of the comedy community, you know, and generous. And, like, he's you know. like he, he's like the new version of Mitzi Shore. Yeah. He's the new Mitzi. Like, what he has created is insane. Insane, man. It's... I don't, yeah, it's... I just, I just, everybody get tickets. That's all I can say. Just get tickets. You're gonna see some great comedy there. I haven't, I haven't seen a bad set yet. Yeah, and uh, you know, Chappelle came in the other night. Uh, that crowd, that's the big. That sounded like he walked into an arena. Right. They were and, so uh, loud. They were so loud when he walked on stage, and uh, and uh, you know, you, you can't help but uh, look at. And Chappelle is the is the is the goat, you know. Just it's hard not to see it that way. Right. And he proved that to me watching him do those sets in Austin outdoors, you know. And the things he was talking about, he was taking them straight to the stage and killing with them. And I'm like, man, what a master of this! And uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, you him, know, him and Louis C.K. Louis C.K. brought me on the road with him, and I just it was like. Like, how, I don't, this dude was born to do comedy. <laughs> like, same with Chappelle. Like, it, it was inevitable. Yeah, I went to see uh, Louis C.K. at the Creek in the Cave. And, uh, man, I forgot how funny he was. And he would just blister in that room. He and he was walking out on some pretty flimsy limbs and just jumping on them, daring them to break. And, uh, and then had somewhere to go with it. It's right. fun to watch. His uh, religious bit. Oh yeah, it was his religious bit. It's like this. Nobody, I've never heard a religious bit that good, in all honesty, ever. So, yeah, I went. I went, went and sat down and talked to him for a little bit afterwards, and uh, you know, it's, and that's you know that's what's gonna uh, uh, that that's gonna who's gonna be attracted to this club is the guys that are. The, the the big guys that are doing these arenas are going to need a place to come and work out and settle in and do a week or two and you know uh, and we're already seeing that happen so uh, it's just the it's just the, the best thing and you never know who's going to pop in right you know what I'm saying like on my on my friend on my show the David Lucas and Friends last week uh, Pete Davidson popped in and you know what well, he's whatever. But he was just a name. And then Shane Gillis, who was a killer, he came by. So that was some dope pop-ins that just showed up. Wow, I got one this week. It's fun. If you want to do some time, let me know. Friday. The uh, Well, the problem I got, <laughs> this is what I'm faced with, <clears throat> is that I've got a, <clears throat> I got a girlfriend at home. And if I start spending five hours a night at the club, she's going to move back to California. Right. It's and so easy to be there five I, hours. I, I want to be there. And then <laughs> when I'm not at the club, I feel guilty because I feel like I ought to be up there helping make it work, you know, like, and uh, which is pretty arrogant. Think it doesn't work without me, you know, but. Uh, no. It, but I do. I feel like I want to do my part, you know, to, uh, and I know I add something right. to it just for yeah. a big name and. Right. And uh, go up there and do a little set. Keep, you know, just keep it all in my head. Yeah, I mean, I bring you up a lot in the tag team system and uh, the pops you get every time I say Ron White. Massive, massive pops, man. So it's like, no, I, I totally get you. I, I, but yeah, you got it. She don't want to come yeah, up Yeah, that's too? like chicken skin. Those massive pops. I could just do that over and over. Just, have, <laughs> just hear that noise right. and, and the love. Right. It's, it's like eating fried chicken skin. Look at that. Not too much substance there, but God, it's so nice. Now that you're a big established name comedian, 
is it hard to work out like new jokes, new premises? You know, Damn, it, something got me too. Yeah. So we should we're, we're close. Yeah. Something something got um uh, is it hard for you to work out new premises now? It you know, I can I can do it. Uh the uh the thing that I need from the club is uh pace, rhythm and timing and uh you you, you gotta do stand up so much that it doesn't make you nervous at all. Right. That it's just a day at the office and uh and so Yeah, I I'm at like seven years and I still get nervous. And and some of that's fine, you know. Some of that's fine, but uh, but you see those guys on the on the Kill Tony. Those guys are they're not nervous. They're jittering. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. And clueless. But I also can't imagine. I know I was nervous the first time I went on st stage, and and. A million people weren't gonna see it. <laughs> right. <clears throat> people always ask me for advice for Kill Tony. I'm like, bro, that shit can make or break you. You don't want to get good before you sign up, right? <laughs> or at least decent. But like you said, if you bomb, a million people gonna see you bomb. Yeah, and the crowd doesn't care if you bomb or not. No. And they're not going to give you anything that you don't deserve. No. And then uh, th that's what's so brilliant about Tony's show is the show is Tony. Right. And the, and the guests. Right. Because that's what's going to make it funny anyway. Right. What they do doesn't even matter. At all. They're like a stage prop, you know. And uh, But it is a genuine opportunity because I've seen people move from that, you know, uh, uh, into – a career that's moving forward, you know? I mean, that's and, what happened to me. And that's off of Kill Tony? Kill Tony, Dora Guy, and uh, clips going viral on YouTube and TikTok. But I mean, my my start was on an all-deaf digital show. Uh, well, in, well, actually my start was in high school. Like I popped real hard in high school when I was like 17. I got on MTV and I thought I had made it. I think they paid me like five grand Oh, wow. Yeah, I think they paid me like five. It was like 2008. And uh, and I thought I made it. I was like 16, 16 17 with like $5,000. I was like, I'm famous. Yeah, now. right. I'm like, rich. I'm rich. Rich and famous. I thought I was famous. And then uh, I quickly, that's I, I got into comedy from doing the MTV show because the writer suggested that I do stand-up. And then I was just going up with all this stupid, arrogant confidence and bombing my ass off. Cause I had two, like I thought I was better than everybody. Right. I thought I, I was like, man, I'll be a millionaire in two years, man. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I go, I go. Uh, you know Bruce, Bruce. Yeah. Oh yeah. So he used to have a room, and my mom would. I was so young. My mom would have. My mom would have to go with me, and I would have to leave right when I got off stage. But I remember. Um, oh, I didn't know any of this about you. Yeah, yeah. My mom would have to go with me because I was, I was like, when I my first time doing stand up was like when I was seventeen. So uh, my mom would take me to these like. And the only time I would do well is if I roasted a member in the audience. Like that's the only time, because I just didn't have jokes. I did, and and the 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 worst thing when you first starting out is to be overconfident. I was just like, they stupid. They don't know nothing. Right, like, right. And you know, I I wouldn't listen. Bruce would give me advice, and I'm like, man, in my head, I'm like, man, I'm better than you. I'm on are you on MTV. <laughs> like, yeah, you know? right. So um, it took me like. <clears throat> How much money you got in your pocket right now? <laughs> exactly. I still got 3800 <laughs> <laughs> So um, I remember the first thing I did with that money. I went and bought, uh, I love speakers. I went and bought these big ass subwoofers and put them in my truck. And uh, I think I bought my mom a purse. And then after that, I had like $2,000 left. And like I took my mom out to eat. <laughs> like, I, like I felt like this 5000 was going to last forever. You yeah, know? right. And then when I went to college, I stopped. I stopped doing stand up because uh, I was in college, of course. And then once I was done with that, I um, I started back doing stand up again. I had moved to LA and uh, started like starting over because, you know, like 
you move to LA, you realize your little MTV credit ain't shit. You yeah, know right. You, you 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 signed up in open mics with people who were just on a soap opera or, or got a movie. Like the comedy store did not care about any of that. Uh, I met Mitzi right before she started declining, and she, her and what was his name? Tommy. Remember Tommy? Yeah. yeah. Tommy did not care. I like I remember going up there in the daytime. And, no, that's me. I'm really the man. I remember going up there in the daytime and. Uh, I told them, I'm like, yeah, man, I need to be on the show. I did MTV. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I think that night, uh, who was there? Uh, what's that guy's name? I can't even think. Um, he doesn't curse. I can't even think of him right now. He doesn't curse. White dude. He lives in L.A. Um I know who you're talking about, and I can't think of his name either. Uh, I can find out right now. This is exactly what's wrong with my brain right here. Jim Gaffigan. Oh, okay. I was thinking about somebody else. Uh, <laughs> so Jim Gaffigan was going up that night, and um, I watched, and then I realized, like, man, I'm, I'm not funny. I don't know what I'm doing. I got to see all the other people who are going up. I'm like, yeah, I'm not funny, man. I got to figure this shit out. And then I just started pounding the open mics and pounding the open mics. And uh, like you like you were talking about, you and your buddy driving 800 miles. Like, man, me and my friends would drive from L. We pack up in somebody's car and drive from L.A. to San Francisco to make $75. Yeah. <laughs> that, but that those were the fun times. And, you know, <clears throat> I took my career a little more serious than a lot of my friends. And I started climbing. I became a door guy at the comedy store. Then I, I I got on Kill Tony, and just kept going. Signed a great management and an agent. And you just now, just, do you have? Uh, I always uh, see you as having a lot of acting potential. If you, if, yeah, I do. Do you act? Yeah, also? I do. I started acting first. I was uh, doing like theater and stuff when I was like in middle school and right. uh, church plays. But yeah. Uh, I do need to get a theatrical agent. <laughs> yes. I do. I love me some acting. And that'd be perfect, man, because I'm I'm um now that like I'm in my thirties. Like, You're a fat guy with a beard, and that's really it. <laughs> right. But you got that pretty face. You know, right. you got that pretty face. And the hair. Yeah, I get it. I get it. But now I'm at that part of my um career where it's like I wanna I love being on stage, don't get me wrong, but I'm like, all right, how can I make money without being on stage? Right. Because now I have to, I mean, you know, I do my podcast and stuff, but it's like I need to book a movie, a TV show, but I don't want it to take me away from stand-up. Well, what happened to, <clears throat> what happened to me is I, I, uh, I didn't get famous from television. You know, like a lot of comics do, they'll get, you know they'll get that sitcom and and that'll take them to a, a stratosphere. Well, I, that didn't happen for me, I, but I got famous anyway, and uh, so it's kind of a good kind of famous, and the, the, the not everybody knows who I am, you know, unless they know of my stand up. And that's, that's all I'm famous for, and I've done some acting. I did a movie with Billy Bob Thornton, and I did a series with Cameron Crowe for Showtime. It just went one season, but it was good. I like doing it, but but I made so much money doing stand-up that anything else I did, I lost money doing because I had to stop doing stand-up to do it. And uh, so that was that big, you know, big guaranteed checks coming in every week. And uh, you got to stop doing that to try to get another brass ring when I've already got a brass ring. And I'm like, well, why don't I just keep this one? So I never, uh, after uh, the, the Cameron Crowe, uh, series, which was called Roadies, uh, didn't go to a second season. Mm -hmm. I told my guys, quit looking. You know, I'm just going to do stand up and then I'm going to retire. And uh, and it's also, you know, kind of a grueling schedule anyway. And it's not as fun as stand up, but you can do it without traveling. You know, so I mean, if you live out there. Yeah, I did a um, I did a Super Bowl commercial. Filmed it back in December. I was only there for like yeah, a week. We, yeah. we all know that. Oh, <laughs> that was a famous commercial. Yeah, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. It was fun. It was fun, man. But uh, it's like <clears throat> being a stand-up comic. You know, it 
everything was too slow for me. I'm I'm used to boom, 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 right. boom. And everything on the set, that's the biggest project I've ever filmed. And everything on the set was just so slow. And I'm like, ugh, a lot of sitting around. It's like, man, I want to do something. Like, yeah. turn the camera on. Just let me freestyle this commercial, man. Well, we had those long days working on roadies and, uh, and uh, Machine Gun Kelly was in it and uh, oh, okay. Colson Baker. And he's actually a really cool guy, you know, and we spent so much time together during that. And, uh, but uh, we had, uh, I'd always bring my tour bus down there so everybody else was in the star trailers and I backed my big old million six. <laughs> Prevost in there, and uh, and every day, you know, it was late into the night, you know, smoking weed. My tequila's all over the bus. The number one tequila, which is the truth. And yes, sir, it is. Hey, what what is it about your tequila that hits so hard? It, you know what? It it's it's the it's our partners in Mexico who have been farmers for 150 years. Wow. They understand ripe and, uh, and they understand how to pick agave and you, you know, it's, and they don't compromise. Right. They're, they're after that, uh, as good as you can get number. Uh, and they're just really good at it. You know, the, uh, you, if you start with the best and you do it the right way, you know, it's expensive to make, but if you don't have a gigantic advertising budget, you can still sell it for a decent price. Uh, a lot of those companies will, you know, it start off with, with a pretty good product and they'll go to picking those plants early. So you can still call it 100% blue agave, but what really matters is how ripe was that plant when you pulled it? Was it seven years old? Was it eight years old? Was it completely ripe? Well, no. No, they just harvest it, you know, and uh, so they can call it blue agave. And that's why I don't have a bite to it. And mine doesn't have a bite to it. And it's just clean as it can be. You have, <clears throat> your reposado is great, but you have the best Blanco in the game. Well, the, the Anejo a little too strong for me. That The Anejo puts me on my ass. Well, it's the same strength. It's just I don't so know. drinkable. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's my... But anyway, they, uh, we would, uh, how'd we, you get into would, that tequila? Alex Ramundo. Oh, uh, he's my partner and it. Uh, he and I were down there on a crawl and he's born in Mexico. Right. And, uh, uh, so he had a buddy that's in the tequila business. He said, don't forget to go to the Robesca's distillery. Oh. Now it's a shithole, uh, you know, compared to the other, you know, like, uh, Cuervo, and they're making swimming pools full of garbage, right? But they're, the half of Tequila Mexico is a beautiful theme park that's owned by Cuervo. So these big distilleries are nice. I mean, nice. Take up, they have car museums and restaurants and, you know, we got nearly dead dogs laying around, <laughs> fat people in dirty shirts and filthy glasses and the best tequila around. And, uh, uh, and Alex was uh, just wondering how he could help them. And, uh, but they didn't have a presence in the United States. They sold it in Mexico as a real high-end premium spirit. They sell it for three times what I sell it for here because of the way it's taxed horribly there. It's taxed to be an export. And uh, so we, we brought it here and, and uh, you know, not really knowing that much about it, but we hired a guy and we really couldn't afford and uh, cause I was never going to risk my, my money. You know, I invested some money in it, but it, it wasn't like we're going to run me dry trying right. to launch this tequila right. company. <laughs> Everybody knows hard work to get a great beard. Uh, beard club is here to help you. Whether you're a baby face or you got a homeless looking beard, it don't matter. Beard clubs got you head to beardclubcom slash David Lucas. Take the beard quiz and they'll recommend a personalized kit just for your beard. Even if you got a baby face, we got vitamins and serums to grow a thicker and fuller looking beard. Grow your best beard today and take 15% off your first order when you go to beardclub.com slash David Lucas and use code David Lucas. That's beardclub.com slash David Lucas, code David Lucas for 15% off your first order. I'll see you there. So uh, we hired a guy named Rich Espy, and uh, he used to run Breakthrough Beverage, which was the biggest liquor house in Nevada. 
So a real knowledgeable guy. He was a really good friend of both of ours, and he'd uh, and and that was the that was the saving grace. That and that millennials read reviews. So if you can scream how good you are at the top of your lungs, but you need reviews to back it up. Well, we can't scream how good we are very loud, but we do have reviews to back it up if you bother looking. So, you know, it's still hard to get them to uh, walk past all that Patron and uh, Casamigos and yeah. and uh, and to go to a brand they've never heard of and go, well, why would I give this a try, you know? I mean, um, yeah, when I was young, you know, a bottle of Don Julio, 20 bucks. 20 bucks for the little bottle of Don Julio. And I mean, but what I learned as I get older is, man, you got to pay for that quality. It's a it's a better hangover. You get drunk on Ron White's tequila, you won't be feeling like shit in the morning, I'll tell you that. It's just so clean. <laughs> That's why I quit drinking. I, you know, the, uh, I, I, I was, I, I, I hate to say that about my own booze, but it was just so drinkable. And it just, it, 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 during the pandemic, man, it just got, it, my drinking was out of control anyway every night, but uh but then it was just really bad i just had to let it go uh, and i don't really blame the tequila so much as i you know blame myself and i i think there's so much liquor you can drink in your lifetime and i just drank mine too fast and now i'm out <laughs> and uh sitting on the sideline smoking a joint going boy that liquor sure looks good <laughs> Yeah, I um I remember when you got back and you told us a story. You went to Costa Rica, right? Right. And uh, you did ayahuasca? Four nights. I remember you said as soon as you did the ayahuasca, it felt like the forest went in your mouth. Yeah, they, uh, they whenever you, it's pretty ceremonious, you know, the uh, ceremonial. And they, uh, so there's shamans and feathers and, you know, live music and stuff. You know, just guitars and flutes and, you know, shit you'd expect to hear, that kind of thing. And uh, it's really nice. It's set up so beautifully in the shaman. So what do I do? And he goes, the first night, he goes, well, there's hammocks outside. There's a big fire out there. And she says, go lay in the hammock, watch the sky, and then come in when it's time to come in. I said, I want to know when it's time to come in. He goes, oh, you'll know. <laughs> and uh, so I was laying out there on the, the uh on the hammock going, I get it. It's kind of a light mushroomy type of thing. And, and then I yawned. And when I yawned, that's when the forest rushed down my mouth into my throat. And I was like, probably time to go in. That's probably the signal right there. <laughs> so you, you go in and you just say, you have a bed on the floor that's all made up. It's really nice. And then you have a puke bucket, which is, uh, or you get the shits. I got the shits. And uh, and I would way rather have the puke bucket thing because you can just get your bucket and throw up in it. You don't have to go to the bathroom. And it, I never thought I'd walk into a room full of people throwing up in buckets, going lucky, lucky people. That could be me. <coughs> but um, so the ayahuasca trip was kind of like mushrooms. It was no, no. It was so much more intense and colorful and not. Uh, in a fun way the first night uh it just it was just so dark and i just wanted it to end but the beautiful thing about ayahuasca is it does end you know just two and a half hours into it you're done so you can do as much of it as you want it but you couldn't do it past a certain time and then at midnight they just turn on the lights and go good morning and when they do it's over and I'm like, wow, well, I can do this. Because I was thinking, I ain't doing it again. I'm not going to do it again. Right. And uh, uh, so the, and the, the next night, you know, it was just pure love, you know. And, and while I was, the first night, I couldn't even get off my fucking mattress. I couldn't even scratch my fucking head. But people were dancing, you know. So, you know, I'm a, how's that working out? I can't even get up. And uh, But it was it was it was uh it was a great experience and i can't wait to do it again don't they do it like in uh Den around denver somewhere so, or Utah? Uh, you know they do it they do it in beverly hills i know because that's where i found out about it but uh this place called rhythmia in costa rica it's number one it's in costa rica and everybody should go to costa rica right that's the greatest place on earth and uh 
and the way they do it there is kind of like a high-end resort. It used to be part of a JW Marriott. And oh. so it's a, the jungle side, it was like overflow. Right. And so he bought that and turned it into this clinic. So it's a medical facility. Oh, that's but uh, but it's, it, it's one of the highest rated uh, experiences on TripAdvisor. It's like a full five-star uh, uh, TripAdvisor wow. thing. So people go there for vacation. And they've just been on a lot of vacations, and they're like, well, let's mix it up this time and go down the Rhythmia. And, and, but it's also about eating healthy. And I mean, there's not liquor there. There's, you know, there's, uh, it, you just get real fucked up on that stuff, which is quite frankly plenty. And, uh, but the, the, the food's good. It's just healthy. And uh, it's, it's about breathing and yoga. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a great break. And, uh, and I had just gotten sober when I went there, and, uh, or I'd better quit drinking for about, a, I guess, about two weeks or something. Did you go call a turkey? Well, I went to that, I went to a hypnotist, uh, which I think helped, and then, uh, and then at some point in the ayahuasca thing, I was like, I really don't have to do it anymore. There really, it doesn't make sense for me to keep drinking like I was. And, what, and, you drink a bottle a night? You know, I, I'm sure some nights, but, but it, you know, it was it, it was just me in a bottle in a room, you know, gotcha. and that's uh, that's no good. And uh, and quite frankly, I and I know that there are people watching the podcast that struggle with the same thing I do. Especially, right. it was so ingrained in my in my show, you know, and then and also being the owner of this tequila company, I'm like everybody expects me to drink. I love to drink, you know. How could I ever fucking quit? And uh, but if you find yourself in that position, uh, you you can. I mean, there are things you can do, and and uh, I really haven't, uh, David, looked back at all. Good since I I quit. Now I know when everybody's drinking tequila up at the club, and ah, you know, it's uh, it, it's it makes me think, but it's not enough to push me over the ledge. And who knows, in a year or two, I might feel like my relationship with alcohol is different than it used to be. But I, right now, that's not in my plans. I, I only drink at, at comedy clubs. That's the only time I'm really drinking. But during the pandemic, I did develop an issue. I think, well, I, you know, I think most people I think did. we all did, yeah. I thought I saw a worm fly off. Come on, baby, give me a little something. That's what I'm saying. I need a little something, man. We on Lake Austin? How we ain't getting no bites? There's fish <laughs> up here, you know. I lived up in on uh, LBJ, and there's just all kinds of stuff out there. Big old striped bass, oh. thirty-five pounds. I'm about to show you uh big old hog legs. I'd be out in my backyard on LBJ and I'd hear a fish jump and splash. And it was so big, it sounded like somebody pushed a dryer off a bridge. <laughs> and I'm like, that was a fish jumping? Are you kidding me? I caught this one at Travis the other day. Oh yeah. That's a big old log. <laughs> They're about six, seven pounds. Yeah, it was like six point eight. Yeah. Yeah, it was a nice one. It was a nice one, baby. It was beautiful. Didn't um, <clears throat> was it just you by yourself, or did the? I don't know. Maybe I'm tripping. Didn't the blue collar comedy tour? Uh, come to Macon, Georgia. Oh yeah, yeah. I thought so. Absolutely. I, I that's uh. I remember seeing the commercial. <laughs> yeah, we toured everywhere. We we went nuts with that that tour. That was a uh, for about three years. We ran it nice, really hard. Nice. And then we got to where we would just get together and make movies because as soon as. As soon as me and Dan started making enough money on our own, we were like, "Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right." And uh, and uh, that was all just a you know a gift from uh, Foxworthy. You know, Foxworthy. 
could have given that job to anybody right. else. Right. And uh, and he gave it to me. And he and I had always been, you know, good friends since the day we met. And, uh, you know, he, uh, that was him being generous with the stage, just like Joe is. Right. And uh, that stuff matters to young yes. comics. You yes. know, it really does. And uh, and it can really change uh, the path of, uh, of your career. And uh, I'll always be grateful to to jeff he's a, he's he's such a good guy you know he he he's still i mean he's he's really religious and uh but he he backs it up with actions you know and that's he, he so he goes and feeds homeless people every weekend wow. and, and does he a ministry in atlanta oh okay he He's a Georgia boy. He from, is he from georgia yeah hapeville right by the airport oh that's, yeah of course yeah, yeah right there he's he's uh yeah, so uh, and still doing well. Got grandkids now, so he don't he don't get on stage no more. Huh? Hey, he does. Uh, you know, he does. Uh, he still does uh, some tour, and I mean, I really don't. I haven't talked to him in a while, but uh, but yeah, he still does some stuff. I think a lot of soft ticket stuff, a lot of corporate stuff. He, you know, he's always one of those guys with a really clean. Brian Regan, that's who I thought you were trying to think of when oh, you. Yeah, Regan, yeah. What's um. What does Larry the Cable Guy do now? He does about 35 shows a year. I just talked to him the other day and uh, on his uh, 60th birthday. He's uh, six? Oh, wow. So he uh, he has a, he I think, a serious XM show. He makes so much money. Yeah. He, uh, yeah, he's got this beautiful studio set up just so if Cars calls him, wants him to do a voice for a game or, you know, anything, he'd just do it right there in his house. And, he, where he in tech? Where he at? Uh, you know, he lives in Lincoln, Nebraska, but, uh, yeah. And then he's got a place up in, I think, Minnesota, big ranch. And then he's got a compound in Florida and, and uh, he, he's also a really, really, uh, really, really good guy. A lot of fun. See comedians, we always get it right, man. We, out of all, out of all the entertainers, we build these compounds and these ranches. Like that's my whole goal, man. I just want to be self-efficient. You know, like live on the water, have area to grow crops. And I know how to do it. I grew up a country boy. Right. <clears throat> Plan for the apocalypse, like Rogan. You ever seen his apocalypse car? His what? That apocalypse, that doomsday car he got. Uh, no. That, Just think, when you think you know everything about somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Land Rover. He's like tricked out. It looks like it'll drive through a building. Really? Yeah. No, I, 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 but I love that new car, that new uh, Escalade. Oh, that wow. thing is, that car doesn't know what it is. No, no. It's confused. <laughs> and it sounds like a Lamborghini when it cranks up. Yeah. <sighs> Stupid car. And you're doing, uh, you're doing, uh, well, by the time this aired, you'll already have done it. But uh, you're doing the opening headlining weekend at the club. I am a big honor. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's just one of those. It's one of those things where uh, Joe just uh, did what he could to keep me from drying up, you know, and uh, give me goals to, you know, just to. And you know what? He was a hundred percent right. Uh, I was in a bad frame of mind when I started uh, thinking about retiring, and I'm. And I'm still, even though I've got an offer for a big tour right now, I think I'm going to turn it down. I think I'm just going to do stand-up in town. Send it to me. I'll, and, uh, I'll do that tour. It's a good one. Yeah, I, I'll do it. Tell him you got David Lucas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me and Tony will take it. <laughs> I saw your uh, tour bus. That thing is nice. <sighs> yeah, I miss that. You know, I, and, 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 and I, I do miss some of the traveling, but, you know, it's... Uh, you know, I always had that sweet gig in Vegas that I did like 10 times a year and the villa and Butler and the limo and, you know, it's it's hard to give that kind of stuff up. But, right. you know, my biggest venue is coming in uh, July. I'm doing the uh, Sonny Hall in New York and my manager set up a driver. I'm like, oh, shit, man, I, I got to take an Uber. <laughs> like, I got a driver. It's a big old theater. I'm like, whew. So and much, that's your show. That's just my show. I'm headlining, yeah. Because he's trying to see how, like, 
a theater tour work. Like, right. the, like the smaller theaters, like, you know, like 500, 500 to 1,200. Cause was, it's that, like what I do, because I'm, I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm selling out my weekends. And it's mm-hmm. like, you can do a theater, we can get you a sprinter, and you can do a theater here. Then the next day we drive there, and he's like, you'll make in one theater what you'll make the whole weekend at a comedy club. So I'm like, let's do it. Because, I mean, that's... Or, or more. Because you can also charge a little more for the right, theater. Right, right. And uh, people know when they had a theater, it's going to be at minimum $75. Right. Because I'm doing, you know, between, depending on the market and how hard it is, like I'm doing, uh, like, I think my most expensive ticket is like 50 and that's like VIP. And uh, we're trying to add, we're trying to implement something where people can uh, buy packages to come on stage and get roasted. Okay. So, like, if it's your birthday or, you know, maybe, you know, a couple is coming and the wife don't know. I mean, the husband don't know that the wife set him up to get roasted, so then we'll have a clipboard. I just call the names on stage. People love it. I've tried it in a few cities, and people love it. I bet. Yeah. Well, you're good at it, man. Yeah, you're good thank at you, it. man. Thank you, man. Me and Tony. I know. That's why when y'all are on stage together, I just get out of the way. You know, <laughs> yeah. Let them take pop shots at each other. Right? <laughs> the other night, the other night, we was on Kill Tony, and uh, me and Tony started roasting each other. It was so funny. And Ron just slid his chair back. He's like, <laughs> He's like, I don't want to get caught in the crossfire. Uh, <laughs> I don't need that shit. I don't want no straight bullets, man. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want no straight bullets. No, oh, man. Like, I, it, yeah, if I lived here, man, like, show, show them the background, B. Like, if I lived here, it would be hard for me. Well, I guess comedy that night, I'd be able to leave at night, but I'd be sitting out here every day. Every day. <sighs> every day. And, you know, <clears throat> I almost... Uh, there were some places kind of up towards the dam that were like three and a half or something, but uh, affordable, not not much of a house, but it's on the, this lake. And I like this. I like this lake okay, but I really prefer LBJ because this lake, if you get one wake boat going through there, it chops up the whole thing, you know, and, uh, and they do that a lot on the weekends. It's pretty loud out here. It gets real busy. And uh, but up there, it's actually a it's actually a lake, and it's pretty big, it's like twenty something miles long. Oh, and this whole river system throughout Central Texas is crazy. The whole little uh, Colorado River, right? And then we've also got uh, the Guadalupe River, and uh, oh, yeah. and uh, that's a good trout river. San, San, go, it runs through what, San Antonio? No, that runs out of New Braunfels. New Braunfels. And uh, that's a big tubing river. People go down there. And it's, it's beautiful. Right. Big old cypress trees like this, except way bigger. And cliffs, and you just float down this river uh, doing whatever your thing of choice is. And uh, and I did that my whole childhood. We'd go down there camp and, uh, and, uh, and tube that river and just have a fun, have a blast. I'm a, my fishing buddy, he's taking me up to uh, Inks Lake. That's a good bass lake. Supposed to be a good bass lake. I'm, I'm a I'm a largemouth guy. I'm a yeah. You'll get some hogs in that lake. I was on Inks Lake and uh, with a comic named Michael Floorwax, and he caught a <laughs> a thirteen pounder. Just uh, yanked it right out of a wow. bush. And that don't even sound like a. Is that a a, a performing name, Floorwax? Michael Floorwax. That was his name. Yeah. Was it a stage name? It was, yeah. It was. Oh, I'm like. <laughs> He was bizarre. He ended up getting into radio. He was really, he had, he had a... Is that the prop comic? No, nah, he's not really a prop comic. But he would do weird stuff on stage, it right? It is we very bizarre on stage. Chris and, Rock was talking about him. Yeah, Chris would have known him, yeah. yeah. He's out of, like, New York or somewhere, right? Or the East Coast? No, he's out of Denver. Oh, but I, I remember Chris was talking about floor wax when he was here in town. That was so funny. Yeah, he was a big club draw for a while, but he had a hard time moving from that crazy act to another crazy act. Mm. And uh, and then he got somebody offered him good money to get out of it, and he did. Yeah, once 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 you get out of stand up, it's hard to get back, man. Like when people talk about Eddie Murphy coming back, he ain't did stand up in thirty years, and what is he gonna talk about? Yeah, but he's Eddie Murphy, you know. I, I saw him do a uh, an int, a, a, oh something. I saw it on TikTok or something, and it, and it was something he had done recently for an award show or something, and it was brilliant. Mm. And uh, but I've seen guys, you know, that's the the trick is to get into those theaters and stay in those theaters. And uh, and I've seen guys who are really good at 
they couldn't do. And uh, uh, so they'd get into them for a little while, like right after a special, and then they'd float back to the clubs, which is, compared to theaters, you know, it's mostly, you know, hell and, yeah. uh, to go back. Uh, yes, and, absolutely. Uh, but you guys have got these podcasts feeding it also, and then and and then the, the and then our tribe here, <laughs> you know, if you count Joe, <laughs> we got pretty big reach. And, uh, Very true. So uh, you know, all that drives business, you know, yeah. and, and and that's uh, you like like I, I believe I think it was Rogan. We we were having a conversation, and he was like, "The sellout theaters across America. All you got to do is appeal to one percent of the population, right? And you're good. And that's you're good. that's insane. That's like, oh yeah. But they need to love you. Yes, they need to love you, and uh, and it's great if the if the, if the men want to have a drink with you and the women want to fuck you. You know, <laughs> not that you should. But I'm just saying, if that's how they feel, right. they're gonna buy tickets. <laughs> right. You know. Right. right. I mean, yeah. That's that's at a at a lot of these shows. I'll do these fucking after parties and. People buy you 30, 40 shots, and it's like, man, I can't take all this shit. I'm like, buy it, buy it from my team, man. Give it to my video girl or, or my merch guy. I'm like, man, I, I can't drink all these damn drinks. Yeah. When I was in uh, Pittsburgh Improv, I did an uh, after party at the Dave & Buster's. Horrible and a great idea. Hanging with the people was fun. Yeah. But then once you got 18 drinks in front of you, it's like, man. <laughs> Yeah, especially when we had the tequila company in it. Alex and I, Alex kept touring with me after. He was in the Latin Kings of Comedy right, with Lopez right. and those guys. Yeah. And then uh, and then eventually he came back to work for me. And uh, so we'd, every night, we'd have something set up with a bar in town with a band and our tequila. So we'd hit the, oh, wow. we'd go straight over to live music and uh, and bring the crowd with us and and uh, just total mayhem. How did fun. How did you uh, ever hook up with Jeff Foxworthy? Oh, Jeff was just, uh, you know, he'd come down there and headline those uh, those improvs in Dallas and Fort Worth. Oh, and uh, so, and I was, uh, you know, I was really uh, pretty smart when I started in that I saw that there were four clubs in the Dallas area. And all the opening acts sucked, including me. But most of them weren't very good hosts. So I focused on being a good host, memorizing my notes, doing a good job. You know, making it feel like show business when other guys are up there fumbling with pieces of paper, getting the names wrong and all the stuff. I never got them wrong. Uh, I just went up there and did a great job of hosting that show. And then they kind of forgot about how much I sucked and uh, because I really took the job serious. <laughs> and so I got more stage time than anybody else. And I didn't suck that long. Right. And uh, and so he and I, he played golf back then, and, uh, and he and I hit it off big time. And Vic Henley, uh, who passed uh, during the pandemic, and uh, so uh, you know we've been friends ever since. And uh, so when he, uh, we were flying around on that jet that he was leasing, doing his shows, I was opening for him. He told me about the Blue Collar tour, and I said, "That's retarded." Why would you have four comics in a show? And, it, um, and I'm like, I, I have no vision at all. I, if it's if it's not already sitting in front of me, I can't right. see it. So, how much time were y'all doing? I was doing ten minutes. Oh wow! And Dan was doing ten minutes, and then Bill would do fifty, and Jeff would do fifty. And y'all were making great money. No, no. But we made good money. Me and <laughs> we were the opening acts. This was Jeff's money. Okay. So they would pay us you know, real good for what we were doing, you know, doing 10 minutes. But that was what was so perfect about the blue collar movie was I got famous off of 10 minutes. So I had this big old hour that nobody's ever seen. Well, mostly, usually people burn that hour getting famous and then they got to go run out and get another hour and it ain't as good. <laughs> and uh, so, so I had all this popularity and nobody had seen this show that was tight as a gnat's ass. And so I got to go out and now it was a lot bluer than the blue collar stuff was. So a lot of people were offended when they came out to see my regular show. And, uh, but whatever, you know, it worked. And, uh, I was, you know, I'd spent years in saloons doing stand up. Right. I knew these people were just like me. Right. And, uh, well, and the manager guy was going, you need to be clean like Jeff. I'm like, well, Jeff's like Jeff. I need to be like me. I gotta be, 
If you if, in stand up, if you're not true to your nature, you're fucked. Uh, because that's the only thing that's interesting is who you really are, you know. And if who you pretend to be is never interesting to anybody. And uh, the sooner comics figure that out, yep. the the further they are ahead in yeah, the game. Absolutely, Abs absolutely, man. Well, I could be here all day, but uh, we got to wrap the podcast up. Ron White got stuff to do. I got stuff to do. I appreciate you, buddy. Anytime, my yes, friend. Sir. And uh, I'll see you tonight. Okay, right? I'll be there tonight. Yes, sir. Yeah, me too. I think I'm going to do all four rooms. Or all four shows. All four, yeah. That's that's the goal. Yeah. I I, I, I still uh, haven't done one in the little room. <laughs>